30. I'm going to call this meeting to order. Cheryl, if you'd be so kind to do the roll call. Ten. Yep. Tim Nath. Here. Dick Declawa. Joe Cower. I know Joe's here. I see him. Hi, Joe. Is your audio on? Okay, his audio is not working either. Um, Larry Lennon? Here. You can go on phone audio. Yeah. Justine Cimaroli? Here. Mike Tolmer? And I know Mike's here somewhere. Yep, yeah, he's here. And Lori Collins? He's not here. Hey, Mike, we just heard you. You did? Yeah, you're good. All right, good. Thanks. Thanks, Court. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> we good, everybody? We need? Carol? Yes. Okay. Um, I'll take a, a motion regarding tabling the approval of the February, February 24th, 2020 minutes until the May 19th meeting. Okay. Thank you, motion. Who, who motioned? I did, Mike. Yeah, I just say your name, Mike. Okay. Second. This is Tim. Thank you. <clears throat> All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Um, before we get, get started this evening, uh, um, we don't have any any uh, old business in front of us. Um, I just want to make some, some comments up front just so that everybody's on the same page and everybody kind of understands where we're coming from here. Um, our course of business this evening is to present 11 planning issues and just to discuss them. The issues were identified as a result of the Bridgeville Com uh, review of the Bridgeville Comprehensive Plan. Comprehensive Plan is a document which was used, which was generated after community, after community planning process uh, in which the public was involved in 2004. Planning Commission started its review um, in late 2019 of the comprehensive plan. After reviewing the plan, the commission identified issues which we deem still needing attention. At the February 24th, 2020 Planning Commission meeting, we compiled some of those issues from the plan review. As a result of the compilation, it is our intent to use these issues as a starting point for discussion and potential planning issues for the future. Members of the Planning Commission have over the last month or so taken these issues and conceptualized them for the purposes of tonight's discussion. Our discussions this evening are focused on the scope and potential solutions for these concepts. Over the course of the next couple meetings, the commission will fine tune the concepts and priori prioritize them for planning purposes. We will present and discuss one concept at a time this evening. It is my hope that the planning commission can review all the concepts this evening. If not, we will continue the concept review at the May meeting. Let me emphasize, this is a very initial discussion of these concepts. Conversations regarding the concepts will be ongoing this year as it will take more discussions to get through the planning, get them through the planning process and, and taking action. Um, I want to try and keep this meeting to 60 minutes this evening. Um, what I wanted, would like to do is have a public comment section, uh, comment period, um, maybe the last 10 minutes of the, of the meeting. Okay. Um, do any of the other planning commissioners have anything to add? To this before I turn it over to Tim? No. Nothing here. <clears throat> okay. Nope. Tim, you want to take it away here? <clears throat> yeah. Uh, and Cheryl, you're fine to share. I don't, I don't need to take the screen share. It's, it's good. So uh, for folks in the Planning Commission, this is a spreadsheet that I, there was a flurry of emails, first of all, today. This was the last of them that came out. Um, and it's just a simple Excel spreadsheet. So to Dale's point, we're gonna kind of step through 10, 11 items. I think it's 10. Um, 
where the author of whoever put that one slide together has taken their initial cut at overall complexity, what they think the, the cost of this thing might be from just a small, medium, large view, and then value to the uh, potential value to the community. Again, small, medium, large. As a collective planning commission, we're gonna sit here, ask questions, think about all of those things collectively. And to, to you know, what Dale mentioned, we're iteratively working through and trying to bring further and further refinement to ultimately where we decide to concentrate efforts for the balance of the year. So to help do that, um, I put together this scorecard and intent is for planning commission members to complete this after tonight's discussion, if we get through the balance of all the items. And all I would need back from you, I put this in my email, but it might make sense talking through it live. All I need back is for each one of the planning commission members, this scorecard complete with your scoring for each one of those 10 issues, right? So I, as I put in my email text, I did it for everybody just to mock up some numbers and give me something to develop the graph that's on the second tab. We'll go there in a second. But let's take Dale for ex example. Dale, when I get this spreadsheet back from you, if you want to delete Justin, or I'm sorry, Justine through Dick and give me back one line, that's great. If you want to just key over your scores and not worry about anybody else, that's fine. If you want to clear contents on everybody and only put, I don't care how you do it, just whatever I get back from you, I will assume is your scoring for those 10 items. Values from one to 10, there's no magic to it other than it helps me get some distance between those items whenever I plot them to a graph. So that's the magic of one through 10. One being small, 10 being large for both the community value and cost. So if you can click on that second tab then, uh, all that's happening on this tab is I'm pulling that into the graph that you see there. And this is a, a pretty basic tool that people use to do cost benefit analysis, right? High value, high cost things are your more strategic items that you need to think about. Do some really good QC around budget requests, chunk it up into multiple phases over time. Bottom right, that's your high value, low cost. Those are the things that you tend to move on pretty quickly because there's very little resources needed and there's a high value to it. So that's future discussion but the scorecard will help produce this. And then we've got a good framework to have future discussion within. Does that make sense? The only other comment before I ask if there's questions back on that first tab, Cheryl. We're, we're working with a scale of one to 10 and there just so happens to be 10 items. The ask is not that everybody has only one item with a one, one item with a two. You don't have to do one through 10. In other words, you can have four items that you decide have a community benefit of eight. Right, so it's one through 10 for every single item and then we'll just net the average and plot that on the, the second tab. Pretty straightforward? Yep. yep. Awesome, awesome, okay. All right, thanks, Dale. Okay, anybody have any questions before we move on? Okay, um, Cheryl, if you wanna put up the, um, the first uh, scope concept, please. All righty. So um, in the, can you hear me? Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, but real quick, Cheryl, sorry. If, can you click on that presentation icon in the very bottom right? It's like the TV screen looking thing. It's, it's right under the budget implication immediately to the left of the minus sign. This one? Yep. Right there. It'll just make it a little bit bigger. Okay. Thank you. All right. So, um, I was tasked with looking at traffic study, main arteries, volume, and speed. And uh, one of the things that I wanted to do was the fact, I wanted to really find out exactly what has happened since the 2005 comprehensive plan, if there was anything that had been done since the 2005 plan was in place and they actually recommended a traffic study. So in February, go back one, who did that? 
Dale's doing it. Dale. So I'm I, sorry. Take control. I can't do that. Okay. Okay. Just push what it back, Dale. What is it you need? Me? Yeah. I just need the first slide that I was working on, the traffic one. There, okay. there it is. Perfect. All right. So um, I honestly think that the challenges that we have to deal with in Bridgeville is that we want to have a safe, pedestrian-friendly community that has a better quality of life. Now, the main arteries, understanding that the main arteries in Bridgeville, Washington Avenue, Bank Street, and McLaughlin Road are state streets. I would really like to find out when the last traffic studies were done for those particular streets and what was the outcome, all right? Now, I did speak to PennDOT on Thursday or Friday and asked them why, uh, their latest traffic report on Bank Street uh, was a negative result, and they said they just didn't find a need for a stop sign at the corner of Dewey and Bank. Now, I asked them specifically if they could provide numbers, volumes, mixes, and so forth, and they said that I'd have to email them. Chances are I'm pro we're probably going to have to do a Freedom of Information Act. But anyway, I'd like to request at least five to 10 years worth of traffic data from PennDOT so that we know exactly how traffic has built up over in the past 15 some years. I also think that it's important that we investigate traffic calming, calming opportunities. And I'm not talking speed bumps. I'm talking other mechanisms to slow traffic down on our major arteries. Um, the other thing is, is that would it be beneficial for us as a community to put radar speed signs up? And I'm not even certain when the last time something like that was done in Bridgeville. Um, I'm not talking speed trap cameras either as much as I'd like to have them, but I don't think Pennsylvania does that. Um, so radar speed signs indicating the traffic traveling on these roads, what their speeds are and what the limits are. Um, the other thing that also helps is an organization or a certification called Walkable Communities. Walkable communities is a certification that a town or a city goes through to try to emphasize safe walking parameters. And that does include traffic and slowing traffic down. Uh, the closest one here is Mount Lebanon. They've been certified for several years now as a walkable community. That in itself slows traffic down, but also gives a sense of pride, I think, to a town that they're able to achieve this. Um, obviously, if we had a larger police presence on our roads that might slow down um, traffic, and um, I don't think it would eliminate the truck traffic, but at least it would slow them down. Um, and then I actually think that just talking to the neighbors here on Bank Street, it would be beneficial to hold a small forum of neighbors to discuss what their complaints or recommendations are. Um, I know talking to people further up the street from me, they've been complaining about traffic for 30 years on Bank Street. So uh, is it time to do a thorough traffic study investigation, which would cost, I don't know, upwards, probably now fifty to $70,000? Um, that would still be up for discussion. Um, but I think it could offer insight into where we should go, uh, short term as well as long term, all right? Um, so the other, the funding situation, probably PennDOT, Allegheny County, our state reps, for um, uh, walkable communities, strong towns, 
and America Walks all have seed funding or additional grant money available. Solution partners would be um, engineering to help um, develop a plan and to look at their experience with other small communities to see what was possibly done in those communities to make the traffic situation a little bit calmer. And then actually to discuss with Mount Lebanon Township um, how it was that they achieved um, the walkable community certification. Anticipated value to the community, you know, I put medium down, but I honestly can't, I don't think that we can put a value on pride. If people are proud to live in Bridgeville because we have this nice Mayberry type of community, you know, I don't think you can put a value on that. But you could put a value on our house prices as they would go up because it is a Mayberry type of community. Budget implications, probably uh, volunteer to 70, 80,000 if you wanted to do a traffic, complete traffic study. So um, now I will just say one last thing for this. In regards to the traffic study, I think that it might be beneficial to at least look at some of the implications of doing small pieces of um, uh, this small pieces of Shady Avenue, things that could happen on Shady Avenue, and what could happen on the north side of Washington Avenue. And that's it for the traffic studies. Any comments? Corrections, recommendations, questions? So yeah. for the, for the um, Planning Commission to, to have a conversation. Right. I guess my only question, Justine, and, and well, for everybody really is, and it's, it's an honest question, like do we all agree that we have a traffic problem other than I'm not underselling it, but people always want people to go slower past their street when you got kids or whatever. Right. I just don't know how to answer that. Do we agree that there's a problem to be solved here or is this a nice to have? And again, it's an honest question. I guess that's the same question I have, Tim. I mean, I'm reading a lot of you know, speeding here and I find myself wondering what particular streets are we talking about that have a speeding issue? Or is it just widespread and I don't have the sense that it is. Yeah. I mean frankly here on Greg Avenue I can tell you that on speed I love my bumpy brick road. <laughs> <laughs> well you know the thing of it is and perhaps we may want to just do a query of the neighborhoods on on Bank Street, on Chartier Street, on McLaughlin Road. Yeah. I, I, I like the idea of the forum. If people feel strongly about it, right. I'd love to hear that. And I shoot, my sister lives next to you. I know she wants people to slow down on Bank Street. I get that. Right. But will that ever be sufficient? Or is it going to be like you recognize the two people a day that are speeding here as well as in Mount Lebanon? I don't know. But the thing of it is, is that how do we know? I mean, you're, you, you can either take my word or Mickey's word or somebody else's word that lives on here, but if we have no proof, how do we know that people aren't speeding, right? I, I, think, I think it goes more further than just speed. Uh, you know, just trying to cross some of these streets, um, <laughs> traffic at times makes it a, a challenge. Um, and this kind of goes into the pedestrian thing that I that I did later on. Right. So, but um, you know, trying to cross Bank Street at, at Dewey, or trying to get across Bower Hill Road, um, or even Station Street sometimes can be a real challenge. Right. Um, and it's you know it's it's volume of, it's it's not just speed but it's volume of traffic it's you know a lot of a lot of things that that kind of boil into that. Um, 
you know, it's trying to get across Bower Hill during normal non um, pandemic times, um, you know, can be, can be a real challenge, can be a real, you can take your life in your hands. Yeah, that's fair. Um, I, I think there's, I think there's some intersections that could possibly be looked at. Yeah. All right. Okay. Anything else? Larry, you got anything to add? No, no, I don't. Joe? Uh, no, but I, I think Justine did a great job starting off the conversation tonight. Uh, I'm impressed. Agree. Thanks. I mean, you know, the other thing, too, is to recognize that no work is going to be done on repaving Bank Street for any time in the foreseeable future. So, I mean, it sounds like a um, uh, shotgun going off every time a, a cement truck goes off the street. So, anyway. All right. I hear, it, I hear that all the time from Frank Exler. He's been all over Pendot about that. But you got it. Yep. Every time I see Frank. I'm on on deaf ears, on apparently. <laughs> all right. Next one is, um, let's see, compliance and code enforcement. All right. Um, so we had a great discussion, I think, in February and discussed exactly um, what could potentially be happening down the road in regards to a new code enforcer or a new zoning officer. All right. Um, as it stands right now, the borough manager is both the zoning officer and the um, code enforcer. So, um, as well as the, the borough manager. Now, it, even in 2005, the recommendation was to look to see in the comprehensive plan was to look and see whether or not they, Bridgeville could hire a zoning officer to take care of it because the borough manager was always too busy. So what I'm recommending is that um, we assess the code enforcement compliance. How are we doing to date on code enforcement compliance? Review those, those areas and either, if possible, change them or enforce them. All right. Now, one thing that I need to better understand is exactly when the town, the borough does ticket or notify the homeowner that something is needs to be done, what happens after that point? So we can discuss that, or I can discuss it personally with other people. So um, what I would recommend for a full solution would be to see whether or not a code officer share, shared with neighboring communities would be feasible for borough and cost effective for the community. Now, since Lori is going to be retiring at the end of May, um, will the new borough manager want to do both or should we separate it? All right. Um, now, first off, I guess we would have to see whether or not other communities like Heidelberg or other, I don't know who else is small enough outside of Heidelberg, whether or not they would have, they would like to share a zoning or a code officer with us. And then we could develop a plan. Um, if that is moved forward, then I think as a community, we should prioritize, okay, is Carnegie small enough to, to include in the community? I don't know. So we can talk about that. The other Sorry, thing, Justine, didn't mean to break up. I just was putting it down. For yeah, that's time. great though. Um, the other thing is, is that if we look at our people, the things that are out of the codes, all right, let's prioritize those offenses and try to get as much bang for our buck in the beginning. So that whether or not it's, you know, getting everybody to mow their lawn or putting dumpsters in B 
buildings or whatever, things like that. Let's get something that has a bigger emphasis on cleaning up the community. Um, I also think in the 2005 comprehensive plan, there was a discussion in there about rental units, absentee homeowners and property management. And um, I think it was Joe that said, you know, this is a rather large portion of the offenses in Bridgeville. I mean, I don't even know if we know uh, what units are rentals. So, um, and then the last question I have is actually to the audience is, is whether or not, is there still housing in the borough that is uninhabitable? Or have they, I think there was a few that were uninhabitable that needed to be demolished. So what does the potential solution look like? Potential solution looks like a part-time certified quality, qualified zoning code officer that she, we share with local communities to improve safety, neighborhood appeal, and whatever the third thing is there. Community, uh, community viability. The funding, you know, if the new borough manager uh, wants to take on the uh, opportunity of being the code or zoning enforcer, then, you know, I guess the question is, will they have the time? Um, I'm not certain exactly what the borough manager makes right now for um, being the zoning officer. So that will have to be discussed whether or not we can come up with a budget or a dollar amount that will allow us to use a part-time person. Um, and whether or not, will this concept be fundable in 2020 or would it need to be budgeted for 2021? Uh, community value is medium, all right? I still think cleaning up the community is a great idea. And budget implication is 2,000 up to a sal quarterly salary for a zoning person. So, all right, that's it. So I guess the first question I would have uh, is, is there a budget allocation uh, in the borough that isn't being spoken for, spoken for is uh, being used to subsidize the salary of the manager? I see that quite often. Oh. And that's why the manager has the title code enforcement officer, because that's the only way they could budget to make the salary. Okay. Do we have that situation here? That I don't know. We could find out. I would think council people would be aware of that, but you know, that seems to be the biggest lift. And then the second point I guess I would make, I'm looking at the uh, property maintenance, sidewalk signs, parking, et cetera. Have we done any sort of an assessment uh, and ranked issues that we see that we believe needs to be addressed and just how widespread they are, you know, that would speak to the need and the focus of a code enforcement officer? You know, just walking around the community, um, there are some instances of rental houses that are, um, um, the, the, probably the porch steps could be replaced or the porch could be replaced or, um, their walk, they're actually, they're parking on sidewalks, all right, because there's no other, so there's no other places to park. So does that require a part-time person to, to do that? I don't know, but I'm sure that we could probably come up with a, a list of things like dumpsters, um, that could be better maintained. Yeah, I'm thinking we've we've talked about this a couple of times anecdotally, but I, there's a 
half dozen properties that I run past on my normal route that are certainly in violation of one or more codes. We talked about the auto repair or repair place that's running a small car use lot at this point, and he knows he's in violation of code. Uh, signs that we have seen that are not repair, like the the bank down there and the across from Rossmore Floors is at a cracked sign for four years. Looks like garbage. So I. An assessment's the right way to do it. I'll fully with you, but I, at least anecdotally, I feel like there's enough to pursue this for value. Right. I mean, even the even the sandwich signs up on Washington Avenue. We talked about that at one of our meetings. You know, is that legal? You know. So anyway, okay. So I, so we should make a list. I'll query and everybody. We can make a list and figure out uh, what upfront violations might be workable, might, might um, work with a potential part-time person. Joe Keller? Yes, Dale? You got anything to say, Ad? Uh, no, I, I don't think we should be going around you know, picking out certain violations. You don't want this guy to be like viewed as the sidewalk Nazi, but I think we need to be a little more proactive and I think we can address things versus waiting for complaints and it'll go a long way. Uh, I think this code enforcement topic uh, actually would have a large value to the community. These are the things that uh, people see uh, that have a quick return on its investment. I think it'd be money well spent. And it might be money that you're already spending. It just, like Eric was saying, you're, is it tied into the borough manager's salary right now? And if you pull it out, you make a separate issue for a, sep a separate, a separate uh, position, the money might already be there to, to bring somebody in to do that. Sure. I do recall that the borough did have as a code enforcement officer, uh, geez, it's got to be 20, 25 years ago. It was separate and apart from the manager's position. Uh, and that was always a controversial thing. Uh, was he doing his job? Wasn't he doing his job? And then when he did his job, uh, people would call to their council people and complain, and it turned into a political football. I can remember all that very clearly. So. Mm. I think Larry's spot on. I think there's a big difference between being the code enforcement officer and the zoning officer. And uh, I, I think it's probably better off to keep the zoning officer aspect the job of the manager. But code enforcement you could really ex expand this and do rental property inspections, start making property safer. And that obviously isn't the job of the borough manager. But the zoning aspects, uh, there's no reason why that can't be. That's just my opinion. Okay. In, in, in Morris, Minnesota, what they did is, is um, <clears throat> the, the, they had a housing authority which, which took care of the, the low income housing, that type of thing. And what the, the city did was, was pass an ordinance and, and made them in charge of um, rental property. And what they did was they started a program. Um, of course, this is a, a college town um, where we had a lot of slumlords and a lot of vacant land, um, absentee landlords, that type of thing. But what they did was they charged all the rental properties up front uh, um, initially um, and I don't remember what the dollar amount was, but I'm just going to throw out like $200 um, a year. Um, and that money covered um, the part-time code enforcement. Every rental property had to be inspected um, initially. And then once again, um, on a revolving basis, every three years. And, you know, they paid um, the, the um, landlords uh, of the rental properties paid a fee every year which helped um, maintain that, that um, um, the funding for the, the code enforcement uh, person to, to go in and do the inspections. And they'd go in and do, you know, um, make sure that the rental properties had smoke detectors and, and CO detectors and, you know, windows weren't broken and doors were working and, you know, didn't have a rodent infestation, that type of thing. Um, and I don't know if that would work here. Um, the other, the other thought that I had that I've seen in other places is um, the fire department has a public safety officer 
which does a lot of the, the public safety um, code enforcement type stuff. Um, and I don't know if that would work here either, but there's just a couple of ideas. All right. So that's, that's it for me. Okay. Thank you, Justine. You're welcome. Mike, you want to talk about trails? Sure. Um, I was tasked with uh, trail connectivity and I was basically focusing on a couple different areas. Um, you know, Bridgeville's a very walkable town, uh, as we all know, but there's a lot of large detours if you want to try to go from one place to the other uh, in certain areas. Um, so a couple, first one I wanted to focus on was uh, connecting the, li the library to the main business district. Um, you know, this is something that's been talked about over, you know, for years now. And the, li I'm sorry, the um, uh, railroad company uh, is a Pittsburgh and Central Ohio or Pennsylvania Central Ohio. Uh, they want, they do not want you walking across the tracks. They want you to put a bridge, which would be extremely expensive. Uh, so we're looking at, you know, what would be a way to rectify that and make it a little easier to do. Uh, currently where Bergs is, that's Bank Street extension. And then you have Bank Street, uh, the regular Bank Street. I don't know if it's possible to connect that, connect those roads in theory. And so you would have to make, so you could put like maybe a, um, a utility road for our borough workers to put up, to get a pickup truck, but that could be like a possible trail to, to, to connect uh, a library to the Main Street. And it'd be pretty, pretty inexpensive compared to a bridge. Uh, so yeah. You're talking an automotive bridge as opposed to a pedestrian bridge? What's that? You're talking about an automotive type bridge as opposed to a pedestrian bridge? No, I'm not talking about an automotive or any bridge. I'm talking about a, because if you go at the end of, if you walk in front of Bridgeville Towers to the end of the right. sidewalk, it's about a three foot drop down to the railroad. So, you, I mean, to put a bridge there would be... So you're talking about a grade crossing? Yes, an accurate oh. crossing. Oh, I mean, we have one, if you go, there's an accurate crossing right down the railroad tracks uh, going from the Tambellini, the old Tambellini's parking lot, uh, right across, it goes down to the railroad street uh, parking lot. There's an accurate crossing. And there's no, there's no safety, there's no, um, you know, uh, pedestrian gates to go up and down when the train comes, it's just a, a crosswalk. So, you know, it's a lot, you know, for some reason it's allowed there. Um, why couldn't we put one, some, something by the library as well? You know, that's, that's one. Uh, another one would be connect uh, Cook School to McLaughlin Park. Now, if you're going to walk to Cook School to McLaughlin Park, it's an over a mile walk by going down Ridge Road and all the way down to, I mean, it's, I mean, Dale, you know, you live up on that hill. It's, you're kind of isolated up on that hill. Uh, Cook School to McLaughlin is about 650 feet apart. So put like a switchback trail that goes from Cook School Road, drop in and drop along the hillside and drop you down in front of the, where the old bridge was, the footbridge that goes into McLaughlin Park. And you essentially, in, that would be a, a low cost. You're talking volunteers and equipment uh, to, to move trees and dirt. Um, so that's one, another area I was talking about. Uh, the steps on Greg Street to Laurel. This is one we've talked about for years as well. Uh, Consul looked into it, it's expensive. Uh, you, it's about, we, we estimated about $60,000 to actually have somebody come in, take out the steps and put it in, pour in uh, new concrete steps. Um, maybe there's a better way to do it as far as getting grants, use borough workers to do some of the demolition uh, and then and break it up and piecemeal it uh, in a different way. Then uh, another one would be connecting Romano Drive to McLaughlin uh, Park. There's already a trail there. Uh, it would just, it's, it already exists. It would just need improved and making an, an official trail. And then possibly a trail connecting uh, where Pennsylvania, Missouri is 
down to McLaughlin Run Road uh, to the end, or to the corner there where um, uh, the old equipment dealership was. A uh, small trail could be put in through the woods is there. Uh, you would need a right of way with some of the neighbors up uh, with uh, the neighbor, one, one at least one or two neighbors up on Missouri and Pennsylvania to go to go between their properties. Um, solution, you know, you could do Wayfair maps uh, with signage showing where the pedestrian traffic could be. And eventually you could tie a, tra a trail system in Bridgeville into a larger trail system like Panhandle Trail or Montour Trail. Um, some of these could be done rather easily uh, using volunteers uh, with equip you know, donated equipment. Uh, others would be a little more involved with like something with going across the railroad, uh, you know, getting try, working with our uh, with, with the railroad to get permission and uh, to, to go and do an act raid crossing. Uh, your funding partners, you know, will obviously be the uh, borough, do grants with CBD, uh, CDBG, uh, Montour Trail, Panhandle Trail, Bridgeville Library, uh, Western PA Conservatory, um, Allegheny Conference, and uh, Pittsburgh Parks Conservancy. Um, you know, that's pretty much uh, what I got. Uh, I think, you know, obviously the value of the community, you know, we're not talking, it's not gonna change work, uh, the community greatly, but it would be a big improvement for, to make our, our town more walkable. And as far as budget wise, like I said, some of them could be done pretty cheap and some of them be a little bit more expensive. Okay, um, Joe Cower, questions, comments? No, sir. I do have a, a question, Tim. Um, those properties, the from like from Cook School Park to McLaughlin Park. All right. Do we know who owns that property? Well, you're talking about the hill, so I mean, it's a pretty steep hillside, so you have to cut into the hill. Right. I know, I know a lot of properties up on Ridge go back fairly far. I don't know how far they go back. Um, if they, I don't know if they technically go, go all the way to McLaughlin Run and down to, to the road. Okay. Do we know how does Cook School um, Park extend across uh, Ridge Road or? Is what? Cook School Park that ex extend across? I don't think if, I don't think on paper it does. Okay. So that's all. That, that was originally owned by the Seal Halls and houses on up there. Okay. All, all, all the property is basically um, ban abandoned property at this point. Um, there's several different. It, it's almost all like one piece of property. But okay. it, it is all, if you get into it, you could have a lot of land problems. So, um, but originally we have a plan as far as council was to take across the street from uh, Oak School Park and put some pavilions and that in there. There was talk back when they were putting in uh, Bettner's estate of rerouting Oak School Park in a different direction to slow traffic. Um, right now, he is basically um, all backed up from taxes, so it could be it could be acquired without much problem. Do you, if you're doing anything over the railroad, do you have to get railroad permission? Does anybody know that? Yes, you do. Yes, you do. Absolutely. What is that like? Is that on the we're of magnitude of like dealing with a pen dot in months and years or I think Back to Congress. <laughs> yeah you're dealing with a federal, federal uh, transportation system okay that's um, i think that's why they say you got railroaded <laughs> actually it's a spur line so it may not be quite as hard but generally speaking railroad is pretty difficult to work with yeah so when I originally talked to the railroad, they were like, they were absolutely not, you're not gonna put a pedestrian crossing over a railroad track. All right. So, so I'm thinking, well, we do have, that's why my idea, 
you know, open up Bank Street all the way to, you know, technically on paper, open up Bank Street all the way to uh, Washington Avenue. And then, so now you're not, you're not saying, hey, we're not putting a pedestrian across this. You could make it, make it at, the, uh, at the railroad as wide as a, a small alley. So, because you could, you're probably going to want, um, if we have in the winter time to go and plow it, you could make it so a pickup truck could go in there with a plow. I like the concept. Is that already a paper street? You know? I don't know. I would think it would be because you have Bank Street extension. Right. I do love the idea. Yeah. I always wanted to be able to walk to Berg. Yeah. <laughs> Well, yeah, I mean, you just think of all the people in our library that are, I mean, the library would kill to have have their library connected to the main street. They're mm -hmm. tucked back there and, you know, people go, oh, I went to the library for the first time today. I didn't realize it was back there. Out of sight, out of mind. That's a classic example. Well, it, it would provide more parking you being able to use lot two. Absolutely. Well, that's true. I think that's a win-win, but. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Any further discussion regarding uh, trail connectivity? Going once? Going twice? Okay, Mike, move on. All right. Uh, Baldwin Street, um, uh, we're all familiar with the plan we did with EPD uh, the, the, uh, between Council and um, uh, Planning Commission, where they did an overall scope of. Baldwin Street. Uh, when they first, when we first talked to or EPD, um, you know, the I think a lot of us thought the idea was, you know, they were going to keep all the properties on one side of Baldwin Street and kind of make a green space between uh, Baldwin and uh, Bar Hill Road. And when we got the actual plan, it looks like they are going to basically wipe out all of Baldwin Street and redevelop the entire piece of property which, you know, being on council and now being on planning commission, you know, we all looked at that and was like, well, that's a very long term project. It's, you know, multi-million dollars, uh, 30 numbers like $30 million were thrown out there and it just didn't seem to um, So looking at, you know, more of a staged or a step program for Baldwin Street, it's stuff that we've always talked about um, would be to really acquire properties in Baldwin and McLaughlin run uh, right. um, those are the areas that are obviously uh, flooded whenever we do have a flood event and you know the only way you're not going to get flooded uh, guaranteed if there isn't a piece of pro uh, property there to get flooded so one of the things would be would be to acquire properties when they would come up for sale. And we've talked about this on council and it's obviously a very expensive proposition because you know, you know, council doesn't have $150,000 of pop to pick up properties when they come up. Um, the empty lots that are already exist, that already exist in uh, Baldwin Street, we could look at those already and see what we can do about turning them into green space, permeable parking, uh, parks, whatever. Um, we also talked about doing a bridge replacement uh, where the beer warehouse is. When we had uh, Allegheny County here after the flood, uh, I believe that bridge was scheduled to have some uh, repair work done. We've asked them to uh, put that on hold and actually look at possibly replacing that bridge. Um, I don't think we've, ever, we've talked to Allegheny County uh, since then about whether or not uh, that's viable or when that when, when the schedule for that bridge is to be replaced. Uh, the culvert, we talked about replacing the culvert behind Dairy Delight. Uh, we are getting that supposed to be getting cleaned out with uh, um, this year that's on the on the list to get cleaned out. So that's going to help uh, tremendously. Um, but eventually a long term solution would be to replace that culvert. And then you know, doing the stuff that we're already doing on Baldwin Street as far as um, you know, the culvert repair, uh, uh, fixing the walls uh, behind Beer Warehouse, uh, stuff we're doing for flooding. Um, 
once all that stuff is in place, then you can look at developers to come in and enhance uh, properties that are already that are still existing and possibly doing redevelopment. You know, you know what a solution would look like. You know, Baldwin Street, uh, a revitalized uh, Baldwin Street would be, you know, a really great thing, I think, because it used to be one of the main business districts in Bridgeville. It used to be the main business district. So to have something like that cleaned up where it's uh, usable and instead of it being something that we think about getting flooded all the time, it's now become some more of a, a, another central business district that could be a, a great thing. Obviously, the challenges would be acquiring property would be costly. Um, we've talked to, we've talked to FEMA about acquiring property, and you know they're I think they're still looking into seeing if it's if we are approved for that. Um, funding pro funding partners would be your usual suspects: SBC, our state reps, state senators, private developers, FEMA, Army Corps of Engineers, Flood Authority, Western PA uh, Conservatory, um, Allegheny Conference. Pittsburgh Parks, um, your usual suspects there. So, but I think we're all pretty familiar with Baldwin Street and we know what the challenges are there. And, you know, we've all talked about it and in our, to each other and either one-on-one -on -one or meetings or whatever about what, what it would look like and what we could do. So. Yeah, it's, you know, I, and it's one of those things that it's gonna be an ongoing discussion uh, for the planning commission, I think for uh, a few years till we get something to come out with, um, you know, something reasonable. Mm -hmm. um, okay, uh, Joe, you got any comments, Larry? Tim? I mean, we, you know, we've kind of hashed it through. I mean, it's it's not it's not new. Yeah. yeah, the only comment is I think that that's something that's going to stay on the list for a long time, but I do think we need to start thinking about how we, how we eat that elephant, right? I mean, we can continue to say it's huge and we'll get to it at some point, or we can start to say here's small pieces that are in the right direction. Um, so I, you know, I hope in the evaluation of all these items that that's one of the ones that kind of perpetuates for a while because it's, it's a problem that has to be solved. That's not a nice to have, so... I think we've got to be thoughtful about what, what are some steps that we can take to get traction at some point soon. Has, has there been any uh, updates as to exactly what's been going on? I mean, has FEMA or Pima FEMA approved the purchase of the houses that are vacant on Baldwin Street? I do not think so. Okay. Can, is it possible for, to get an update? Yeah, we could check that. Is there anybody from council that's on that can speak to this? Yeah. <clears throat> so this is Bill. It has not been approved as of yet, but it's still in, in consideration. We, we understand that we are still in the running for that process to happen. Okay. But it is, low, I mean, you know, it's a big government. It ain't going to happen overnight, so. Right. Especially now. They're not, it's not going to happen now. <laughs> yeah. Spending money on other things now. Yep. Yeah, well, that's, I, yeah, I, I think it's some, one of these things that I think, you know, it's been on the list. I think we keep it on the list and, and um, you know, trying to keep moving, trying to come up with answers and, and ways to move forward with it. How many actual properties are in front of FEMA for consideration? I believe. I thought it was like 13, 12 or 13 or something. I, I heard 13, Mike. Okay. Yeah. Are you waiting for a disaster declaration to get FEMA money? Is that the, the hold on? No, this was done after the flood. Yeah. So it was, you know, we, everything was considered a disaster, but it, it all comes down to, you know, they look at the, the value of the houses and, or the values of the properties. And is it um, worth to buy it or to let it keep flooding? Uh, no, I get that. I think that's going to be the hard decision for some of those property owners because they're only going to pay appraised value. Mm -hmm. And some people may owe more than what the appraisal is. Right. So someone's going to have to take a haircut. And mm -hmm. a lot of people uh, aren't in a position to do that. So it makes it difficult. I think it might be a mixed bag, Joe, because there were some that were actually pleased with the value that was placed on the house. So 
you know, I, some will take a haircut and I think some will maybe make out on it if it goes through. Yeah, I remember after Hurricane Ivan, we had that before and uh, some did well and some didn't. But at the end, the end result was pretty good. So I, I understand. But I, I think going back to Baldwin Street, we've been talking about it for years. It, it would be nice to maybe digest, uh, you know, Mike Slidemore and actually have what or what's phase one? What is phase two? And then maybe that should be the priority instead of this big apple. Right. That that's why it keeps getting kicked because it's so big. Like my slide, it's such a big problem that unless it's phased, it's it seems like make believe. Yeah. <clears throat> one of the, I think one of the first phase would be to you would have to have something in you know have uh, have a uh, something in place where people you can't redevelop property on the creek side uh, so it keeps people from buying property you know, if you sell a piece of property you can't buy and redevelop it um you yeah, know that's the first thing i think uh, and that's that's just a matter of you know writing into a law or, or putting into a zoning law. Um, it, it, as long as people keep buying property, developing it, you know, moving into an apartment, or whatever, you're, you're just going to be in a certain vicious circle. Okay. Anything else for this? Okay. Not hearing anything. Um, I think I'm going to stop um, concept tonight. Um, I, I want. I'd like to open it up and just see if there's any other public comment um, regarding any of this for 10 minutes or so. Um, I do have another um, meeting here later, <clears throat> about 20 minutes. So uh, if we can kind of go through and see if there's anybody, any of the council members or or um, um, uh, Pat's out there. Does he have any words of wisdom for us? If I could go back to, this is Bill, if I could go back to the uh, number two with Justine and the code enforcement zoning. Uh, I didn't chime in only, I, I thought you guys were, this was your discussion, you know, and, and so um, we do a little of what you were talking about. We, we have the borough manager is actually sharing the uh, position of zoning officer. Uh, we found uh, that in a perfect world, that's not a bad thing in Bridgeville. It, it's, she works, uh, you know, there's not that many zoning problems that we can't handle. The, the issue became coding, you know, enforcement of coding. And, um, and, and again, in a perfect world, we were using an, a third party, an outside resource to actually do our coding. Uh, I agree with, this that it needs to be uh, more stringent. I think we need to put some, you know, some more arms around that process and, and make sure that we're leveraging a coding officer moving forward. So, uh, but I just want to let you know, we, we do, Lori does share, uh, or she does actually serve as the zoning officer here. And, and really um, it doesn't take a whole lot of her time. Okay. Okay. Um, anybody else? That's yeah. Hi, it's Pat. Hi, Pat. Uh, I don't know if they're uh, particular words of wisdom, but I did notice uh, that Mr. Tomer came up with uh, what I thought was a very low cost step on the uh, Baldwin Street issue. Um, a simple recommendation that the zoning on the Crick side of Baldwin Street be changed from mixed use to conservation. Might be an interesting first step. Uh, it uh, certainly expresses the borough's position regarding the future for that area. I could see that having a lot of blowback. It would, but if there is, if there is an unwillingness to change, then one must expect to continue to get the same result. Um, you know, the, the EPD plan that was put forth was a, a first step. Now I, 
I don't know that anyone other than maybe EPD liked the concept in its entirety. Um, I'd, I'd submit that as a planning commission, I would look to your body to come up with what is the future plan for the corridor. Not just Baldwin Street, but the corridor coming from Upper St. Clair Township all the way to Washington Avenue. That includes the bridge, the culvert, all of the things that, uh, uh, that Mike talked about. At this point, the only plan on the table is EPDs. And we're not, as a community, I don't think we're happy with that plan. Wouldn't the role of, the, wouldn't the planning commission's, you know, objective to be to come up with a plan that you are and that the community is behind? Mike, Dale, I mean, yeah, that's... Yeah, I, I think that's an interesting, interesting idea. Um, yeah, I, I, I think it's a, it's a good place to start a discussion. I, I think that, you know, um, I don't know the ramifications of, of changing the zoning. I mean, um, there's, you know, that's why, why we've got a solicitor, but, you know, I, if we changed at least parts of that, the north side of Baldwin Street, changed it to conservation. Um, somebody more education than I about this, I presume that any business that's there now would be grandfathered in until such time as they wanted to try and change it, and at which point in time they would not be able to. I think the, I think the first step that you take, you know, let's assume that people would consider a rezoning. The very first step to be taken is a comprehensive plan update that talks about the land use and talks about the future land use and comes to a conclusion that uh, that an appropriate land use would be to turn that entire flood corridor into some kind of a conservation district. Uh, that would have to go through, again, the whole comprehensive plan process for adoption, but that's your first step to a zoning change. Uh, otherwise, you know, I worry a bit about spot zoning issues, uh, and, be, and I, I also think that that would get, you know, lend some credence and some support to that whole concept, and personally, I'm not uh, opposed to that. I mean, you know, being an engineer, he who lives in a flood zone should expect to get flooded. So why don't we just make it a conservation district and do away with that issue? But that's just the engineering thing. But Lay, I, I I agree with you. Uh, while you know the uh, uh, the idea of changing that area to conservation, uh, you know, Carolyn Yeagle mentioned early on, you know, the concept of a mini comprehensive plan looking at just the corridor as just a plan for that area, the land use from Upper St. Clair to Washington Avenue coming down the, uh, the Bower Hill Road corridor. And that, that would serve as your foundation to then make the decision to change the zoning to conservation. As, as Larry's pointing out, you know, I, I, the way I presented it was first the change and then the plan – Larry's right. You, first the plan and then the change in in, uh, in zoning. Yeah, I, I don't know what a mini comprehensive plan is, and I don't know how that squares with state code. Um, I think that Carolyn was suggesting that it not follow that it not follow the whole mantra of a full borough comprehensive, but looking at the, a small area and coming up with a plan for that area having public hearings and adopting a plan for just that area. Just like you could adopt it for a regional plan of three communities. I think Carolyn's position was try and do the same thing just for a narrow area of land use. So. Okay. Hey, Dale, I did have one question, if I could. I'll be, I'll be quick. So you guys are put, doing all of these items, all the, the, the templates, which I think is great, by the way. Um, what is the next step after you rate them? 
Well, what, we, what we'll do is, is uh, based on discussion tonight or discussion as we go through this, uh, some of that stuff will get back added added back into the scope um, for for scope and and funding and solutions that type of thing. Um, we'll do this. We'll, we'll come up with a rating system, which is what Tim's going to do. And then based on that, we'll have, you know, May meeting, June meeting. Um, we'll go through and try to put some sort of, um, some sort of, um, um, be able to try and put this in some sort of terms that we can, we can take a look at and at, that point in time, we turn around to the borough council and say, "Hey, look, here's some things that we've been kicking around. Um, you know, how do we best, you know, how do we best fund some of this? We got Project A here that that probably is not going to take that much money, but will add some value to the community. Um, the, the Baldwin thing, you know, we need to look at that in the long term solution." So it's, it's all about taking some of this stuff and trying to put it into bite-sized pieces and, and give it to you guys so that you guys at least have some ideas for funding for, for that type of thing in the future. You know, two years, five years, 10 years, 20 years. At least, you know, it, it, when you guys are doing your budget scenarios, that type of thing, you can, you can go through. Tim, you got something to add? To yeah, I mean, I, I just <clears throat> kind of harken back to the overall annual calendar that we put in front of folks in the last two meetings. This is step one to get everything that made everybody's hit list discussed more collectively. From there, there's gonna be a subset of things that we probably collectively agree, low value, high medium cost, not gonna pursue it right now. The goal out of this exercise is of the 10, we say here's the four, I'm making up numbers, here's the four that we go hard at. Two of them can start right now. You two, I don't know who those two are, you two plus some help, go get started on them. If Baldwin Street's one of the ones that makes that list, then we have this conversation and say, what's step one? And you go into more detailed planning, you get into a business case of, you know, here's detailed information on what we want to spend and what the anticipated value is. So um, and that's, that's the plan moving forward over the next Q2, Q3 is to get down to here's the three, four things we're going hard at, make assignments, put resources to it, and you know, these things where we're saying solution partners and potential funding sources, they're all potentials right now. Let's nail some of those down, start those conversations. That's next steps in my mind. Answer your question, Joe? Yeah, thank you. Okay. Nick had a question too. Uh, yeah, I mean, Joe kind of asked it there, but I kind of more of a statement now. Um, it sounds like so far a lot of these ideas hinge on the idea of zoning and code enforcement realignment having an officer do these things because a lot of these things can build off of each other from such especially with the zoning with the railroads and all that and then the code i mean if we get uh rental properties listed and coding properly you know that may change i mean i hate to stay tunes but some people's point of views on baldwin street um and some of those properties essentially there's a lot of uh i mean I've seen it myself. There's a lot of apartments that are being rented by people who do not live in the area. They don't take care of the buildings. And then they just let those individuals deal with what happens and they take the FEMA money. They take the money from the, that disaster relief and these families get left out in the lurk. You know, it's, um, I think it's a wonderful opportunity. And I think you guys are on the right track with everything you're stating. And I really appreciate all the hard work you guys have been doing. Thank you. Okay. Can I vent real quick? Sure, Joe. Uh, it's been, I guess, about 10 years ago. We had an issue with some rental property or gas leaks or whatnot inside the property. And at the time, we didn't have a program where, where the borough could go in and inspect these rental properties. So I asked Devore and Cheryl Valentino, and they went to less than 20 surrounding communities. All these communities have programs where the borough, the fire department, whoever can go in these rental properties, which are income producing properties like a business, and inspect them. And the word got out, uh, basically a lot of citizens stormed the Bastille and that was it. Council wouldn't go for it. We were trying to get a program going. 
So it's been a while. Hopefully, I would love to see something done with these rental properties because they need work. They needed work 10 years ago. It didn't work. Times change, so hopefully you guys can get something going. Because that it ticked a lot of people off back then. That council just forget about it. So that's all. Well, it's one of those things that it's going to take everybody's support, you know, to. to Unless we like a lot of the, uh, a lot of the properties here, from what I understand, are out of town. We got people in Texas and California with property in Bridgeville. Seems strange, but it's true. But a couple of the locals, like I said, it's been a long time ago. They more or less let their families know that they didn't want any more uh, costs on them or anything as far as their properties. But I mean. It's done in most of the other communities around you. I think it could help us out. Or you're worrying about appearances of property. And it's a safety issue, too, I think, some of these places. So I, I guarantee there are some properties inside that are not compliant. <laughs> and, and that's my biggest concern. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, maybe we have some conversations with, you know, Heidelberg and or Joe, Joe Cower, you still on? Yes. What, what, what are some of these other communities? Do you have any? Uh, I think we all pretty much are doing rental property inspections and you take it piece, you know, year by year, you make it safer. It works and it, it can pay for itself. Mm. But it does, it, get, for it does get people, a lot of people don't like it, but I think we have a backbone and stand up for ourselves for after, after a little bit of a wave of some controversy, just because people don't like change and people don't like them telling people telling you what you got to do. I think it will work, but I think we need to be unified. Yeah. Well, I'd, I'd, I'd like to chime in here for a, for a brief moment on the, on the freight train heading down to rental properties. Cause it's interesting to me that I've, I, the only person I don't think I've heard from is Bruce. Okay, um, I don't know. Do any of the of of you that are advocating for these rental property inspections and there's a problem with rental properties? Do any of you own a rental property? No. Or have anything to do with one? Yeah, they're in my neighborhood. And affect. No, 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 I, I do you own one, Tim? No, but you asked, do they affect me? And the answer is no. No, yes. no, I, that, no that was not my question. You my did. question you is a simple a one. Part to your question I, is that or are related in any way, and my answer is yes. No. Are, are you related to someone who does own a rental property? No, irrelevant. Okay, so you're affected by bad landlords. Absolutely. That, I, that absolutely. And I'd also point out, Tim, you're affected by bad homeowners. For sure. When you absolutely, when you have a bad homeowner, you're affected by it. When your neighbor keeps their property in a bad way, you're affected by it, the community's affected by it, and it's a bad thing. Whether that, na whether that neighbor is living in Texas or he's living in the home right next to you. In fact, in some ways, a bad homeowner is worse. Because at least when you have a bad, a bad landlord, you've got two people to deal with. Okay, One is the person who's living next door to you and keeping in, in squalor. Okay, that you can say, wait a second, that's a problem. And the second is the guy that's in Texas who owns the property. Okay, so you've got two people on the hook for it. Whereas with a homeowner, all you have is the homeowner. Okay, now, yeah, it works out wonderfully. And yeah, it, Joe Cowery, it does pay for itself. Okay, but I'd point out that if we're going to, if we're going to be working on making sure the properties are safe and good for the community. Let's do this a little more evenly. Let's do it for the homeowners too. I mean, after all, we should inspect everyone's home as well. Just because you own the property and live in there, why shouldn't you also pay to have the code enforcement officer come in and take a look around and make sure that your home has a smoke detector and a CO2 detector and that it's good for you? Because as a renter, you now became a business owner and your responsibility is to your business. Yes, Absolutely, Nick. You so are responsible to, you your, are to, your land, to, to the tenant. Correct. So now you've got a tenant that is trying to make sure that his property is good and a landlord. Now you're trying to add a – who is making sure that the homeowner is protected? 
homeowner. I'm kill myself. That's my prerogative. Right? What is, what is, ah, I see. Pat, what is the exception you're taking to trying to make sure that rental properties are maintained safely? Not an exception to, to the rent, just an even handedness that all properties are maintained safely. I, all I, properties need to be safe. All properties need to be maintained. All properties have to be treated and made to, to come to code. All properties. No, yeah, I don't disagree. The biggest violator okay. of my block is a home owned property that we have turned in a number of times. I don't disagree with you. A exactly, Tim. And that's all I'm trying to, to come back to you with is broaden the scope. Broaden the scope and then we've got a whole different a whole different discussion here. It's not just one group of properties. It's 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 exactly what you're saying, Tim. Yeah, I, I let's mean, make our community better. <laughs> it's a fair point, Pat. I just don't think anybody. We're talking in generalities, and I can't imagine anybody is going to challenge the fact that rental properties oftentimes are cared for less than full-time homeowners. That's why you charge I, I, insurance, right? I, I I don't know that I'll agree with that, and I, I tell you why I say it. Because there are real bad home properties, okay? And I, you know, I, I wish I could agree with you that if you added them all up, you're going to find the rental properties are the majority of or, 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 uh, or outsized in the community. I don't know that that's the case. I, I, I okay? suspect the MLS has a reason for listing how many rentals are on a block when they're de developing or deriving a home value. There's reasons for that. Sure. Oh, absolutely. We are – look – I personally think that home ownership leads to to more inclusion in the community and less transient nature. Hey, I get the, I get the value of home ownership versus rental. I'm not I'm not disputing that value, but in code enforcement, in property maintenance, there I'm going to push back a little bit, Tim. Joe Cower. I think you've got bad bad homeowners the same way you've got bad rental properties. Okay. I, I think we're getting a little off track. Uh, we had a whole discussion on code enforcement. Justine did a wonderful <laughs> job. If you look at her slide that she presented first, there's not one single reference to the word rental on her slide about code enforcement. So right. she, she did a great job. I think this just evolved. In, I think it, yeah, it, it's, it's just what it, it, it's just when it went down the line to, hey, it's rentals, that I, I picked it up and pushed back a little bit. Okay. Uh, we can continue this conversation next next time in May. Your next meeting is May 24th, I believe. Um, and we'll continue on with the concept, concept scoping. Dale, Dale, one quick request. If, if, so by my count, I think we went through four slides. If, if the Planning Commission folks can get me their scoring for those four, just so it's not an out of sight, out of mind, and everything more recently sounds better than we would have done this month, that would be helpful. Okay. Everybody's got their charge to a hair. Um, any last comments? Tim, did you send us all that spreadsheet, or how, how do we do that? Yeah, it, was, it came out late this afternoon. If you need it again, don't hesitate to reach out. It's just a blank spreadsheet that I can go in and fill in the numbers. Yep, there's one, there's a tab on there called scorecard. Just put it in for your name and you're all set. Good, cool, thanks. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, I, I thank you all for participating in the hard work that you've done um, and a good discussion. And I look forward to uh, continuing on um, in this. I'd certainly take a motion to adjourn. Make the motion. Tim made the motion to adjourn. Do we have a second? A second. Mike seconded. All in favor say aye. 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 Thank you very much and stay well, everybody. All right, we'll see you. Thank you. Cheryl, thank you very much for thank your you, help. Cheryl. Thanks, Cheryl. You're welcome. Have a good night, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, Cheryl. All right. <laughs>